Hello, and welcome to Monthly Mailbag, where we address your burning science questions. We got a great question from a video where we talked about how the Earth doesn't fall straight into the sun. Kate said it was because the Earth has quite a lot of sideways momentum. This is the same principle that keeps satellites, both natural like the moon and artificial like the International Space Station, from crashing down. But one viewer wanted to know where the Earth got this sideways momentum. This leads to all sorts of other interesting questions, like why do the planets move in the same direction? And while we're thinking about the arrangement of the solar system, why are all the planets in the same plane? And why are the big planets far out? And what's the deal with the asteroid belt? To answer these questions, we need to tell the story of our solar system's origin. Space is a dynamic place with big clouds of gas and dust swirling between galaxies, stars whizzing past, supernova exploding, and black holes collapsing. In some regions of space, you can find a lot of gas and dust nice and close together. These are called molecular clouds. The movement of all the particles in the, in the molecular cloud is mostly random, and there's a certain amount of pressure from when the particles bump into each other. Competing with this outwards pressure is gravity, the fact that everything with mass attracts everything else with mass. And if a molecular cloud has enough stuff in it, and if it's closely packed enough and it isn't too hot, gravity will pull everything together, which makes the gravitational attraction even stronger, which will pull everything closer together, which leads to stronger gravity, eventually leading to total collapse. But if the initial conditions are even slightly different, if the cloud is too large or too light, there won't be enough gravity to overcome the pressure and you won't get collapse. And we really want collapse because that's when all the interesting things start happening. The guy who figured out a formula for this critical size and mass was a guy named James Jeans. And he actually worked here. He lectured in this very theater loads of times. He gave nine Friday evening discourses. He gave the Christmas lectures in 1933 on space and time. Uh, and he was actually the professor of astronomy at the Royal Institution from 1935 to 1946 which is a position that no longer exists, but I kind of wish did. So once it starts to collapse, the angular momentum that the cloud had at a large scale is conserved. And we'd expect the cloud to have some angular momentum because space is such a dynamic place. All of the particles are whizzing about in random directions. It'd be very weird for all of them to cancel out perfectly. Now, you might be thinking, surely, if it's a random process, every direction would be equally likely. So on average, they'd cancel out and you wouldn't have any overall momentum. But there always is. Why? Think about flipping coins. If you flip two coins, what are the chances of getting exactly one heads and exactly one tails? 50%. There's four possibilities. You can get heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, or tails, heads. And only two of those cancel each other out exactly. If you increase the number of coins, you can ask that question again. What are the chances if you flip 100 coins of getting 50 heads and 50 tails? It turns out that there's an 8% chance. So 92% of the time, you're not canceling things out exactly. What about 1,000 coins? It's a 2.5% chance that you get 500 and 500. The more coins you add, the lower the chance of everything exactly cancelling each other out. But the universe is much more complicated than just a pile of 1,000 coins. There are trillions upon trillions of particles. Each one can have any momentum in any direction. Uh, and so the chances that everything cancels out exactly is very, very low, which is why molecular clouds always have some momentum. And that's why protostars spin. So you have a giant collapsing cloud with a bit of spin. And as it gets smaller, because angular momentum has to be conserved, it starts spinning quicker. The same way when a figure skater draws their arms in, their rate of rotation goes up. And that increased spin is what flattens the cloud out. Spheres will flatten when you spin them quickly, just like blue tack on the end of a small motor. So if you take a small sphere of something soft, like blue tack and you put it on the end of something spinning, and then if you attach uh, the rest of the power source, you can get it to spin and it'll flatten out. So what started off as a sphere just by spinning ends up as a plane, which is exactly what happens when, um, when molecular clouds start to shrink, uh, kind of when they start collapsing in, they start spinning quicker, and they flatten out, which is why the whole solar system is in the same plane and we don't have anything orbiting kind of up and down. So now we have a flat spinning plane of material collapsing in on itself. And at a certain point, the center will get dense and hot enough to start fusing hydrogen, and that's when a protostar becomes a star. Meanwhile, in the rest of the disk, you've got a bunch of gas and dust whipping around, knocking into itself. And denser materials like iron and silicates will sink closer to the star, but are kept from falling in by the speed of the rotation and by the solar wind, which is a fast stream of charged particles that comes from the star and pushes things outwards. The bits of dense material keep knocking into each other and are creating more and more material, eventually becoming the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. At about five astronomical units out, which is just shy of the orbit of Jupiter, is the snow line, where it's cold enough for volatile materials like water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, to become solid rather than gas. And so they can start smashing into each other and accreting into cores that will later become the big planets like Jupiter and Saturn. 
Jupiter and Saturn got really big relatively quickly, which is what allowed them to capture hydrogen and helium before it all got blasted away by the solar wind. Uranus and Neptune are actually thought to be failed versions of Jupiter and Saturn. They never quite got enough material before the solar wind took over. So that completes the set of four terrestrial and four giant planets around our Sun. But what about the asteroid belt, that ring of material between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter? Where did it come from? Because Jupiter and Saturn formed so quickly, every time the bits in that space got even close to being planet-sized, what we would call planetesimals, the big planets would essentially rip them apart, flinging bits into the outer solar system, absorbing quite a bit of material, and sending some stuff inwards as well. And it's that inward stuff that we care about because that's what enables life on Earth. In the early days of the solar system, it was too hot for much water to exist at Earth's distance from the sun. You had to get out to the asteroid belt before water could freeze and clump together. And then when those clumps got started getting thrown around by Jupiter and Saturn, it's lucky that a lot of it landed here on Earth because without that water, I wouldn't be able to be sitting here in this lecture theater. Life as we know it is impossible without water. So to summarize, where did the Earth's angular momentum come from? It came from the angular momentum in the molecular cloud that went on to form the Sun and the solar system. But why did that molecular cloud even have any angular momentum? Because of the statistical fact that it's very hard to flip lots of coins and have them all cancel each other out exactly. And why do all of the planets move in the same direction? Because they were all formed from the same molecular cloud. And why are they all in the same plane? Because when things spin, they flatten out. And finally, why are the big planets far out? Because there's a lot more light stuff than heavy stuff in the solar system, and light stuff only becomes solid far away. Isn't the universe awesome? We tried something new with Monthly Mailbag this time. We took an in-depth look at just one topic. So let us know what you think. As always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, or reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook. If you like the work that we do, make sure to subscribe for more videos. I also want to particularly thank Merrick Kakula, the public astronomer at the Royal Observatory Greenwich, and Martin Davis, the public program manager here at the RI, who helped me wrap my head around this nebulous topic. See you next time.